Well, first, I just want to thank our worship team for that set of worship. I hope it lifted your hearts uh, as it lifted mine as we worship together. He's so good. We trust him, and we will see the victory come. Well, over the last three weeks, we've had Dr. John Dixon with us. He's been gracious enough to preach uh, to us God's word, and I always learn something from John when he speaks, so I'm grateful for that. But some have said that he's, um, over time, sort of exerted a certain influence over the rest of us as pastors. Some say even to the way we sometimes dress. And I don't know, I just don't see it anyway. Well, I've mentioned before that I spent the year after I graduated from college living in Geneva, Switzerland. And while I was there, I attended a small English-speaking Baptist church where I became friends with a Canadian guy about my age named Phil. Here we are. It's not the greatest photo, but it was 1979. Uh, and in case you're wondering, I'm the guy on the left. Yep. Late 70s. Those were the days. Well, toward the end of our time there, my time there, Phil and I decided we wanted to make a trip, a backpacking trip all the way to Athens, Greece. So we took a, a, about two weeks, and we took a train from Geneva all the way down to southern Italy, then a ferry boat 24 hours across the sea to Greece. And we wanted to go to Athens, but we thought we might be able to visit the ancient site of Corinth first, you know, from the Bible, Corinthians. And we got off the train in modern Corinth, not realizing that ancient Corinth was seven miles inland from modern Corinth. So we walked and hitchhiked those seven miles so we could see the ruins of Corinth. When we finally got there, we were so tired and so hungry, we didn't want to spend what little money we had on a restaurant. So we found a street vendor, and we bought a big loaf of bread, bigger than this one, um, a hunk of cheese, and two of the biggest pears I've ever seen. That's all he had, pears. And I don't even eat pears. But have you ever been so hungry and so tired that a big piece of crusty bread tasted like filet mignon? And that's the way it was that day. Uh, we sat on the side of a road and broke that big loaf of bread into two pieces and had one of the most satisfying meals in my whole life. To this day, every time, almost every time I have a piece of crusty homemade bread, I think about that meal so long ago in Greece. We'll come back to bread in just a minute. Today we begin, as you saw on the bumper, a brand new series called Unrecognized King that's going to take us all the way to Easter Sunday morning. Uh, in each story we're going to see, seven stories uh, between now and Easter, we're going to see that Jesus makes a statement about himself about his identity, about his authority, about his purpose. And in each story, someone or a group of people will fail to recognize him. We'll be mostly in the Gospel of John. And you may remember that John, of all the Gospel writers, makes very clear the purpose of his writing. He says in John chapter 20, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So we're also going to see that John tells these stories with a kind of pattern. Uh, there's a miracle that takes place. John calls these signs. And then there's Jesus teaching about himself. And then there is a response. Uh, how many of you watched the Super Bowl last Sunday? Oh, I guess many of you did, either by yourself or in groups. Uh, and if you watch the Super Bowl, you watch the commercials, there were at least two commercials, uh, the ads that came right out of the Bible. First, there was the State Farm ad with Arnold Schwarzenegger saying, like a good neighbor. I don't know if that's a very good Arnold or not, but he said, and they were trying to get him to say neighbor, and he kept saying neighbor, and that comes out of the Bible. Jesus said, love your neighbor. I'm tempted to say it like Arnold, but I won't. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then there was the he gets us ad. Remember that one? Interestingly, this ad, straight out of John chapter 13, where Jesus washes his disciples' feet, sparked lots of response. In fact, controversial response, even outrage. Now, whatever your response to that ad was or is, here's the point. We can either see Jesus through our own personal, cultural, or political lens, or 
we can let him tell us who he is. So we're going to see that Jesus makes very clear, provocative, and even revolutionary statements about himself. And then the things that he says and does grow increasingly confrontational. And then the responses he receives are increasingly hostile through these seven stories we're going to look at. And I think we'll begin to get a sense that Jesus is almost orchestrating a journey that he knows will lead to the cross. And so we're going to walk with him and with the crowds on that same journey. Now, before we read our passage today, a little bit of background. The chapter 6 of John's Gospel begins with the miraculous feeding of the 5,000. Most of you probably have a general uh, remembrance of what that story was about. It goes like this. Jesus has been teaching and healing uh, the sick. Large crowds are following him. Uh, John tells us that a very large crowd, 5,000 men, would have been bigger if you counted women and children, uh, are gathered together outside of town to hear him preach and teach. Uh, he teaches late into the day, and the people are hungry. So Jesus says, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? It's a weird question. Philip says, one of the disciples says, it would take more than half a year's wages for each person to have just a single bite of bread. In other words, can't be done. Peter then finds a, little, a young boy who has essentially a sack lunch with him. And he has the, fi the five loaves and the two fish, and they bring it to Jesus. And by the way, this is the same meal Jesus fed his disciples after the resurrection in John chapter 21. You can read it there, bread and fish. And from that sack lunch, they feed the entire crowd and have 12 baskets full left over. That's the miracle that starts off John uh, chapter 6. And the pattern is the miracle is followed by a teaching, and now here's the teaching. John 6, I'm going to begin in verse 25. You can follow along on the screen as I read. When they found him on the other side of the lake, now let me explain that for a moment. Following the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus sends his disciples in a boat across the Sea of Galilee to the other side. He goes up to a mountain to pray. And during the night, a storm blows up, and the disciples are struggling in the boat, and Jesus walks on the water to them and gets them to the other side safely. And that's the second miracle of the story. Jesus then um, continues to teach. The, the crowds follow him, hearing that he's no longer there. They follow him all the way around to the other side of the lake because they, they want to hear him teach some more and maybe see another miracle. So when they found him on the other side of the lake, they ask him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man, that's how he referred to himself, will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they ask him, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they ask him, what sign will you, uh, then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven for the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Let me pause here for a second. This is the first of seven I am statements Jesus makes in John's gospel. We'll be looking at at least four of them in this series. We can easily miss the, the, the thrust and power of what he's saying here because we're not steeped in Jewish uh, culture or the Hebrew language. He's actually making reference to the very name of God, Yahweh, in the Old Testament, I am that I am, and applying it to himself with different metaphors. Here it is, I am, the name of God, the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. 
For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but, will, but raise them up in the last day. For, for my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. At this the Jews there began to grumble about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? We're going to look at three things today in the story. The bread of physical life, the bread of spiritual life, and then the bread of unbelief. Beginning with first, the bread of physical life. Uh, many years ago, when my family lived in Orlando, Florida, I was home from college one summer. And my two younger brothers and I and a good friend named Joel uh, decided to go to a local pizza joint called Tom's Pizza. It was just a little hole-in-the-wall place, but uh, it was known for uh, a reputation where if you could eat 13 slices of Tom's Pizza, uh, you could have your name written on a concrete block in the wall and be memorialized forever. And so we went. We wanted to, we wanted to try that. And so we... we we ordered a couple of large pizzas, uh, and we, we made our best effort. And I think we all reached 13 pieces of pizza. I think Joel, who was a six foot five guy, I think he had 17 pieces. And we got to write our names on the wall. To my knowledge, they're still there to this day, all our names and how many pieces we ate. But that accomplishment came at a price. <laughs> we felt bad. It wasn't even good pizza. Uh, our youngest brother actually got sick in the parking lot on the way to the car. Uh, but here's the thing. Uh, by the next day, we were hungry again. Right? That's the way physical hunger works. Uh, Jesus says, verse 26, Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed the seal of approval. Then they ask him, what must he do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Now, a couple things to notice here. First, physical bread is necessary. It just is. Bread represents the most basic of human needs, food, nourishment, life. In fact, the ancient prayer of the Jewish people at mealtimes was, Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who bringest forth bread from the earth. Bread was the symbol of God's provision for life. That's why in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus taught his disciples to pray, Give us this day our daily right, bread. Because bread matters. Physical bread matters. And that's part of, part of why we have the Shepherd's Heart Ministry here at Chapel Street. Because food matters. It sustains physical life. That's part of why Jesus multiplied the, the loaves and the fish for the crowd that day, because they were hungry, and he cared about them in their physical lives. But it wasn't the only reason he did that miracle. He also did it to demonstrate something about himself. Next, we notice that physical bread is not only necessary, it also spoils. Verse 27 Jesus says, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Now, physical bread spoils in two ways. Uh, first, uh, bread, food, satisfies the body, but that satisfaction is only temporary. Uh, some of us uh, may have, I don't know, eaten a few too many chicken wings during the Super Bowl, or chips and dip, or whatever your favorite is. Maybe just a few too many. But just like with Tom's Pizza by Monday, we're hungry again. Food also spoils literally. It just doesn't last. Have you ever uh, taken something out of your refrigerator or out of your pantry and checked the expiration date and found something like, best if used before June 2019? Just, the other, just last week, one of my sons took something out of our, took some chips out of our pantry and looked at the back of it, and they said ex expiration date was October 2022. Food spoils. Even bread, if left out, will grow hard, crusty, or moldy. 
within a few days. Now, finally, notice the question that people ask, verse 28. And they ask him, what must we do to do the works God requires? What must we do? What must we do to please God? What sacrifices must we make? What religious rules must we keep? And maybe, in fact, I think it's quite likely that someone here this morning may have thought about God or faith or religion like this for most of your life. Tell me what I have to do to earn my way into heaven. <clears throat> and you've lived under this burden of questions like, how often do I have to go to church? How much do I have to give? What do I have to do to be good enough for God? Jesus gives you the answer, verse 29. And Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe. To believe on the one he has sent. Jesus is saying you've come to the right person, but for the wrong reason. You've come looking for physical bread. I want to give you spiritual bread. You've come to the right person asking the wrong question. You've come asking what you must do to please God. You should be asking who I am and what I will do for you. And that leads us to the second point today, which is the bread of spiritual life. The bread of spiritual life. Way back in the late 70s, some of you may remember this, rock star Bruce Springsteen uh, recorded a song called Hungry Heart. Part of those lyrics go like this. Everybody's got a hungry heart. Everybody needs a place to rest. Everybody wants to have a home. Don't make no difference what nobody says. Ain't nobody wants to be alone. Everybody's got a hungry heart. And I think there's some truth to that song because every human being is created with a hungry heart. The Bible says it this way in Ecclesiastes 3, he has also set eternity in the human heart. That is, every human being longs for, searches for, aches for, hungers for at least three things, if you will it all down. First, we hunger for love, to be fully known Fully accepted and fully loved. Dean Ornish is a Jewish physician and researcher who writes, the need for love and intimacy is a fundamental human need as primal as the need for food, water, and air. Secondly, we are hungry for meaning, to know that our lives matter in some way, that there is purpose to this life. Austrian psychiatrist and Holocaust survivor Viktor Frankl wrote, this is the core of the human spirit. If we can find some meaning to put at the center of our lives, even the worst kind of suffering becomes bearable. And thirdly, we're hungry for hope. For hope. Arthur Kleinman is a professor of psychiatry at Harvard who writes, hope is what makes the human condition livable. But I'd like to add to that and say that hope is that which robs even death of its power. When we drive past a cemetery, when you attend the funeral of a loved one or a friend, when you see another news story about a tragic death, I think deep down we all wonder, what if that was me? What's next after death? And how can I know for sure? So this crowd comes to Jesus, they're hungry for physical bread, and he wants to point them to their own spiritual hunger. Verse 30, so they ask him, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, <coughs> excuse me, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Now here they're referring to the great story of the Exodus. Uh, in Exodus chapter 16, when the people have no food, they've escaped Egypt, they're in the wilderness, they think they're going to die there, and God uses Moses to provide manna, this mysterious bread-like substance dropped from the sky every morning that, so they can eat and be sustained. So the people are saying to Jesus, you gave us bread yesterday, can you give us another sign today? Verse 32, Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my, my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. 
For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. I think they're still thinking about physical bread here. Then Jesus declared, and this is the center of the story, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I I told you, you have seen me and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. So what does Jesus mean by I am the bread of life? Two things. First, he's making a dramatic statement about himself. He says, I am, applying the name of God himself, Yahweh, I am that I am, to himself. I am the bread of life. And then he's reshaping their understanding of their history and the purposes of God. They remember the story of the Exodus, how God delivered his people from slavery in Egypt. They remember, (coughs) excuse me, how Moses spoke with God. They remembered how manna in the desert appeared to them. They want Jesus to do another miracle for them, to give them bread, to fill their bellies, to give them a sign that he is indeed from God. Jesus is saying that he is not Moses, rather that he is greater than Moses. He's saying the bread he offers is greater than the manna in the desert. And then secondly, he's moving them from a focus on their physical lives, their physical bread, their physical hunger, to their spiritual need, their spiritual hunger. He's talking about spiritual bread. He's come not to give bread, but to be bread. He is the bread that satisfies the hunger of our hearts. First for love. In 1 John, John the Apostle writes, We love because he first loved us. In chapter 3 of 1 John, I don't have this on the screen, he writes, This is how we know what love is, that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. He satisfies our hunger for meaning. In Matthew 6, Jesus says, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. He invites us to live and serve in his eternal kingdom. He satisfies our hunger for hope. Right here in this story, he says, For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. So we can know with great confidence that the end of this earthly life is not the end, but rather the beginning. And thus death loses its grip, its power, and its fear. He is the bread that provides love, meaning, and hope, the bread of eternal life. And then the third part of the story we see is what I'm calling the bread of unbelief. The bread of unbelief. My uh, junior year in college, I think it was, I was required to take a science class to fulfill the requirements of a liberal arts degree. And so I signed up with some of my friends uh, for a class that was for non-science majors called Physics 101. Uh, We just called it bonehead physics because it was for non-science people like us. Um, My roommate at the time was a guy named Mike, and he took the class. We sat together in the back back of the class and tried to pay attention. Uh, Well, early in the semester, the professor was lecturing on something called the red shift. Now, some of you know more about this than I do, so I hope I get this reasonably right. It had something to do with why the sky is dark at night. Uh, He said that, With the billions of stars there are in the universe, uh, when we look up at night, every single point we look at should be filled with a point of starlight because there are billions of stars. The question is, why is it dark at night? We only see a few stars. Well, he said the sky is dark because the universe is expanding at such a rate of speed that the, the stars are receding from us so fast that the light they emanate is shifted out of the visible spectrum just due to speed. So we can't see it. And right about that point... My friend Mike, sitting right next to me, closed his notebook, and he said, quietly enough that only I could hear, he said, I don't have to believe that. And he was done. That was it. I don't have to believe that. 
See, what he decided is, he made up his mind that what was being taught was, was beyond his understanding and therefore decided it could not be true. Verse 40, 41. At this, the Jews there began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, <clears throat> the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? I said at the outset uh, of this, this message in the series that uh, as we study these stories, Jesus will make a statement about himself, I am, and in each story, someone or a group will say, uh, no, you aren't, and they'll respond with disbelief, resentment, eventually with murderous anger. John says some began to grumble, and you can almost hear the grumbling. What? What did he say? What's he talking about? Who does he think he is? Why do they grumble? First, because Jesus isn't giving them what they want. They want another miracle, another sign, another show. They want bread to fill their bellies. Secondly, <coughs> because Jesus, <coughs> Jesus has claimed to be greater than Moses, the great hero of their past. He gives bread greater than the manna in the wilderness. Thirdly, because Jesus isn't who they think he is. Jesus claims that to not only come from God, but to be God. He applied the I am to himself. And they respond with the bread of unbelief. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven. They are saying essentially, we know he cannot be who he says he is because this is just not true. They decided that because they believed it could not be true, it was not true. But the story doesn't end there. Let me continue with the part I haven't read yet. Verse 43 of John 6. Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. He repeats it. Your ancestors ate manna in the desert, and yet they died. Yet here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Do you, you do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. So the others were other disciples. These are the 12. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. So this story, like each story we're going to look at in this whole series, presents several questions. And we'll see the same questions over and over again. Who is Jesus? First, who do we think he is? Who do we want him to be? And then who does he say he is? And what are we looking for? Are we looking for a little more physical bread? A little more of what our world has to offer? What is he offering to give? What is the spiritual bread he's talking about? And how do we respond? And we'll see this over and over again. There are really only two responses. One is unbelief. It can be for a whole number of reasons. There are many who have already decided that the cultural narrative is what they choose to believe about Jesus, that he's, he was a, a great man who lived at one time in history, said it was a role model, taught some great things, but not God. The rest of all that is just sort of religious fairy tale. There are many who have decided to, to find love, meaning, and hope in other places, in other things, in relationships or in work or in achievement or in whatever the universe might provide them. It's possible uh, that I just described someone who might be here today or watching online. You're here because you're inspired by Jesus, but... The whole God thing, the whole eternal life thing, maybe not so much. The second response is to believe. That is, you accept what Jesus says about himself. With Peter, you said, 
To whom shall we go? Where else can we go? <coughs> you have the words of eternal life. And so our hope in this series, all seven weeks, is that as John says, that you would believe he is who he says he is, and that by believing, you would have life in his name. Would you bow with me as I close today? Lord, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for the provision of bread. For physical bread, we depend on the food you provide, uh, the blessings of, of material life, but not just physical bread. Physical bread is temporary. You offer a different kind of bread, a bread that satisfies the deepest hunger of our souls. And Lord, if there's just one here today or one listening today that's struggling with doubt or unbelief, who wrestles with the claims that you make in your word, I just ask you to speak to them gently today that you would tap on their heart, nudge them in a way that is personal and supernatural, that you would open their hearts to receive you, even in this moment, as the bread of life, and that they would receive, and in believing, they would have life in your name. And all these things we pray in your name. Amen. Just for the benediction, I remind you that... If you'd like to spend a moment in personal prayer or to pray with someone from our prayer team, the glass room is set aside for that purpose. It's in the lobby. On that side of the lobby, you're welcome to join them there or just spend a few moments there by yourself. Here is now the benediction for today. May we go now in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the bread of life.